So we've got a bit of a different one here today. Ever since I got done doing the turbo conversion on my XR6, I've been chasing a turbo M86 series LSD diff for it, just so I can be sure that the rear end of the car can handle the power reliably. In Tasmania, these are really hard to get, like anything else, XR6 turbo, but I finally found one after looking for about two years. I got it home and gave it a bit of a clean up and everything, some paint, and it wasn't until I put on this little homemade stand here that I noticed that there's a little bit of play in the pinion bearing. So I can't really put it in the car like that. I've rang a few shops around the place and been quoted around $800 just to put some bearings in this. So I figured I might give it a bit of a go myself. So I've just got a dial indicator here set up against the diff flange. And this will allow me to measure the play that I'm feeling in the bearings when I'm wriggling it. So I've got the dial indicator set to zero. And you'll see when I wriggle the flange there slightly causing that needle to move approximately a four thousandths of an inch or so. There should be absolutely no play in here at all, so what that means is that the bearings have lost their preload. This could be caused by one of two things. It could be either wear in the bearings themselves or damage to the collapsible pinion spacer. So as far as I can tell, there's absolutely nothing on the internet about rebuilding these M86 diffs for the XR6 turbos and the XR8s which I found quite surprising considering there's so many of these cars around being modified and it's quite common for people to change the diff gears in these and fit true track diff centers so I've never rebuilt any sort of a diff before let alone one of these M86 LSDs so armed with the Ford service manual and probably a two hour session on YouTube watching diff rebuilds I'm going to give it a go and see how I go with it it doesn't really look too complicated to me, so I think I should be fine. But I'll film my progress as I go along with it. And it should be able to help anyone else out in the future anyway that wants to pull one of these apart and see how they actually work. So the plan so far is just to disassemble the disc, get everything out of it, and then have a look exactly what's gone wrong. And then I can determine what parts I need to actually put into it. Before I pull the diff out of the car, well, before I pulled it out of the cradle it came in, I should say, I did do the procedure for checking the actual LSD clutch plates themselves. The way this is done is essentially by locking one axle and then rotating the other axle with a torque wrench and measuring how much torque it takes for it to cause the friction plates to slip. This was still nice and tight, so I'm going to leave those alone and hopefully it all it'll take is just a set of bearings in it and a new crush foot sleeve. Before I go any further disassembling the diff, I just want to take a quick measurement of the backlash and to paint some gear marking paint on the gears to have a look what their current mesh is. My reasoning for wanting to do this is because these are used diff gears and I don't know how many miles are on them. There's a good chance they've been run in this position for a good long time and the gears have likely mated to how they've been ran. So if I was to put it back together in a wildly different setup to how it currently is, I suspect that may cause some diff noise. Ford service manual calls between 0.13 and 0.18 millimeters of backlash. My dial indicator is imperial and measured in thousandths of an inch. This translates to roughly 5,000 to 7,000 of an inch of backlash. And this should be checked across multiple gear teeth because there can be some variation between them. Currently got the dial indicator set back to zero. If we wriggle the gears here, we should see our measurement. So that there is sitting just a smidge over 6 hour backlash, which is on the looser side of spec, but still in spec. Now there is such a thing as proper gear marking paint. However, I've heard a lot of people have gotten away just fine with using an oil-based artist paint. So that's all I have here. Really cheap and easy to get. So we'll paint this on the gears and then we'll check that gear mesh. So now I've got some gear marking paint painted on here. You just want to grab a rag or something and rotate your gears round and then wedge the rag in these gears just to apply some pressure against the ring gear. And this way it'll help wear that paint. You just want to rotate it backwards and forwards a bit. And 
And there we go, there we can see our gear mash pattern. So I've spun the gears around now and we've got our contact pattern marks here. We're looking here at the drive side of the ring gear and you can see that the mark is quite low down on the teeth. And if we come over towards the coast side, it's much higher up towards the top. Now I'm fairly sure these marks are generally meant to be closer towards the centre of the teeth and they're meant to be the same on both sides. However, I do need to consult the Ford manual to be sure of this. From what I can tell, I believe that if this is incorrect, it's most likely caused by the incorrect shim thickness underneath the pinion. However, there is no preload on these pinion bearings anymore, you've got to remember, which may be allowing the pinion gear to move up or down when I'm placing load on it, making that mark there incorrect to what it realistically should be anyway. Either way, that gives me something to reference when I'm reassembling the diff and some more things to check out. So now I've taken measurement of the backlash and had a look at the gear mesh of the diff in its current setup, I can get on with disassembling it. The first thing I need to remove is the diff centre itself. Now if you've had a look at a lot of diffs, particularly the live axle ones that have been used in Falcons forever, they usually have basically a metal block on each side here with two bolts in it and you remove that and that gives you access to your carrier bearings and you can lift this whole assembly straight out. They set up the backlash and bearing preload with some shims on each side and that's how that's set up on those style diffs. However, on these M86 diffs, they don't use that system at all. Instead, they've got these screw adjusters here, which house your bearing races. So your axle goes straight in the side here, and these themselves can screw out as far as I can tell, which allows you to free the diff center. Your bearing preload and backlash is set up by just simply screwing these in to your desired position. Now, obviously, you're not going to buy a ready-made tool off the shelf for that. So I've got to come up with some sort of idea of something that I can use to get in here to unscrew these. So I went down to my local hardware store and just sort of walked around for a bit until I found some things that I thought would work to pull these screw adjusters out. So I found these here. It's some sort of blanking plate that was in the plumbing section. I've got a couple of M8 high tensile bolts and a nice quality impact socket that I'm going to sacrifice. So the plan is, is basically just to drill some small holes around here and tap a thread for these bolts. They'll screw straight through and they should grip into the size of those slots and those screw adjusters on the diff. And then I'll weld this socket here straight on the top there and then I can clip my ratchet straight into it and hopefully it should pull them straight out. Thank <laughs> you. 
So here's a little tool I've made for pulling out the screw adjusters on the diff. It's not the prettiest thing on earth by internet standards, but it should work just fine. Our ratchet there, clip straight in. And it fits straight in the side of the screw adjusters and I can spin them straight out. So on all of the copies of the Ford manual I've seen, the page that shows removing these is missing for some reason, but as far as I can tell just looking at them, they do look like they just wind straight out. So we'll find out about now, I guess. You can see that tool fits in there nicely. Yeah, they just wind straight out. That's all there is to those then. Get the other side out and that carrier should come straight out. So there it is with those two screw adjusters or carrier bearing holders removed. So now I should just be able to lift that whole entire diff center straight out without much effort. So there it all is with the carrier removed. I've made sure just to put a little bit of yellow paint on one of these for the one that goes on the side where the ring gear bolts are just so I can make sure they go back in the correct way. I don't imagine you really want to mix them up. From the quick look I had the bearings on the carrier bearings seemed quite fine. There wasn't really any bad wear or anything on those, but the pinion bearing here is a totally different story. You spin that. here that's the play where the preload's gone there's rattly sounds in there and they just don't sound very good at all so we'll get the pinion out next and we'll have a look at those i've just made up a little bar here to hold the pinion still so i can undo the pinion nut all this is just a length of flat bar bolted down to the flange there the bolt size is a M10 by 1.5 for anyone that's wondering. Now I've taken the pinion nut off, I'm just going to hit this a few times and it should knock the pinion gear out. What I have done, I don't know if it's overly important or not, I've just made a little witness mark on the splines in here, just so when I put it back together I put this flange on in the exact same way it came off. I really don't think it matters in this application, but I figure I might as well do it just in case. that's fallen through. I should also mention I've got a heap of rags in there as well just to shield the gear when it falls so it doesn't damage any of the teeth. There's our pinion gear all removed. Now that I've got the pinion out, all that I've got left to do is to remove the bearing races from the diff housing itself. I don't know how well I can capture it on camera, but you can come down and hit on the back of this lip that you can see down in there with anything you can find really that will reach. Just give it a good few hits with a hammer and it should knock the races clean out of the housing.
So I ended up quitting filming halfway through removing those bearing races after hitting my hand with a hammer about 27 times because I was trying to use such a small little punch to knock them out. I ended up just putting the diff case on the floor and finding a bigger tool to do it with. The bench was flexing too much, it just wasn't helping things. Anyway, after that I got them out fairly easily. So you've got here your router pinion bearing. This goes in the front of the diff housing here, behind your diff flange. Here you've got your pinion shim. This goes behind the bearing race for your main pinion bearing and sets your pinion depth. You've also got here your collapsible pinion spacer. This is what you basically crush when you do up your diff flange nut and that holds pressure on the two bearings which is your preload. After looking at these bearings they're definitely both no good however I believe it's a smaller bearing here that's the one that was causing all the problems you can hear when I spin it it sounds awful it's got a lot of scoring in the race and it feels like it's got some flat spots in some of the rollers themselves this one spins a lot smoother however the race has also got a heap of pitting in it and a couple of little grooves in it so those two bearings definitely need to be replaced as for the bearings on the diff center themselves, from the quick look I had at them, they look like they were totally fine. They spin nice and smoothly, but I'll have a closer look and see if they need replacing as well. The bearings look like they're just very generic, typical Timken bearings. They're easy to find, so I should be able to get them from any old bearing shop. And I should be able to get the collapsible spacer, plus a new pinion seal from Ford for pretty cheap. So I'll go back over it now and just check everything and work out exactly what I need and then I'll get the parts ordered and then I'll check back when it's ready to get put back together. So after having a closer look, I've made the decision that I'm going to replace the carrier bearings as well while I'm at it. While they do spin nice and freely, I can see a little bit of wear on the bearing cups and for the sake of saving a couple of dollars, it just makes no sense not to do them while I've got the entire diff apart. Now, removing the cups out or bearing races out of these little aluminium screw adjusters here is a bit difficult. There's no way that you can get a tool behind these at all to knock them out. I've already replaced one here, and what I did is I took my little rotary tool here with a little cutoff wheel on it. I just cut at an angle through the bearing cup, being as careful as I could to not hit the aluminium itself. Once I got most of the way through that, I took a cold chisel, put it in a little slot I'd cut and just gave it a couple of whacks with a hammer and it split it straight in half and then I was able to just lever it straight out. As for putting the new one in, I just sat the new race in there, grabbed the old bearing cup and sat it on top of it and then just slowly tapped my way around with a hammer bit by bit until it's seated properly in there. Now as for getting the rest of the bearing off the diff centre itself, I can't make use of my mate's hydraulic press like I did for the pinion bearings. The reason for this is the actual space on each side of the press, this won't fit through. So unless I want to get inventive with a way of trying to make that work, I think it's just going to be easier for me to do the exact same thing I did for the bearing races here and then just cut through them, knock them out with the cold chisel and then if I want I can either use the press to press them back on or I can tap them on with a hammer or however I really want to do it. Now just before I go and cut these, I've just put a little bit of tape here covering up the hole where those needle bearings are, just to stop any dirt getting in there. There we go, so there's our bearing cup removed. 
that one was a little bit more difficult than the last one just because of the fact that when I went to split the bearing race it didn't break nice and cleanly like the first one I did and instead it broke out just chunky so I was left with a small little piece attached still down the bottom here that I had to work with but anyway I persevered with that for a little bit and was able to get it out without too much issue so now what I'll do is I'm going to put our new bearing race in the freezer for half an hour or so just to cool it down and then I'll heat this up with my hot air gun I've got this will help expand the aluminium a bit and just make it a little bit less of a tight fit trying to get our new bearing cup into position so I've just gotten this nice and hot with a heat gun there taking care not to get too hot because I've still got brand new axle seals in there which I don't want to cook in the process but it should help making installing that bearing cup a lot easier I've just got the bearing race here fresh out of the freezer all nice and cold so now I just work at tapping it in go the race is all in and seated nicely there we go so there's both our races installed and the side adjusters it's definitely not the most elegant way to go about removing and installing them but when you're doing this sort of work in your shed and you don't have a million specialist tools you just got to make do with what you've got sometimes and if you're careful about it it really works fine anyway so next up i just need to look at getting these bearings off of the div center and putting new ones on and that's that taken care of so I've just got to get these bearings off the diff centre now. First I'll cut the actual cage here that retains all the rollers and take that off and then I'll just cut the inner bearing cone here and then split it in half with a cold chisel just like I did with those bearing races before. So there's all the old bearings removed and ready for the new ones to go on. I've got the old carrier bearings here, the large pinion bearing and the small pinion bearing. What I've done is I've actually honed out the inside of the cone for the large pinion bearing and this way it'll slide easily over the pinion shaft here and make it so I can use this as a tool to help press on the new bearing. I can do the same for the carrier bearings using the old races, 
but I shouldn't need to bother machining them because they're already split so they're not going to get stuck on there. I have two reasons to believe this diff has actually already been apart once in its life before. Reason number one is after having a closer look at the pinion spacer, it looks to be solid. If I compare this to the new replacement that I've gotten from Ford, you'll see it looks like your typical collapsible spacer. It's got a little void in here for it to crush, whereas none of that's present on the one that's been removed from it. I'm 99% sure the diff would have left the factory with that in it, and it's not uncommon for people when they rebuild them to opt to use a solid spacer. The second reason is because of the bearings. I've got a mix match of brands here. I've got Koyo bearings in the carrier, FBJ branded for the large pinion bearing, and the small pinion bearings are Timken. This diff most likely would have left the factory all with Timken in it. So that's another reason I think it may have had some bearings change in it at some point in its life. As for the replacement bearings, I've just got off the shelf here Timken parts. They're very easy to get a hold of and quite cheap. For the carrier bearings, you have set 47, and you'll need two of those, obviously. For the small pinion bearing, it's set 67, and your large pinion bearing, set 64. Now, don't just go into the diff shop or bearing shop where you want to get these and just order those parts because there is a chance that your diff might have something different in it. I don't know if these have changed throughout the years and there's small variations. So it is best off just to remove your old bearings first and have a look on your cone or the race and you should see somewhere around here part number. So you see the original carrier shell is LM10. 2910. If you take these to your bearing shop and give them those part numbers, they will be able to tell you what set that belongs to. But most likely, the diff will probably take these. Just a quick little tip, before you put your bearing cup back inside the diff here, just have a look down inside the hole here where you've hit the old one out. I had ballooned out some of the metal a little bit just where I'd slip with the tool I was using. So I've just come in here with my little rotary tool again and just cleaned that surface up so there's no edges there that are sitting slightly proud. Alrighty, so I'm back from a mate's place now. A huge shout out to him for letting me borrow his press, it made the job heaps easier. But if you didn't have access to one, you could manage to do it anyway. Got the new bearings installed on everything. And the new bearing cups are also installed in diff housing. Got a new collapsible spacer. Pinion seal. And O-rings to go on those side adjusters there. If you pull the old ones off, I'd suggest just go to a shop that sells O-rings and buy them. These are ridiculously expensive from Ford. They're 25 bucks a piece. And honestly, the O-ring's probably worth $2. But I've got them anyhow. So next up, it's just time to start reassembling the thing. Before I can put the pinion gear back in the diff housing, the collapsible spaces to go on, there's nothing much of that. It just slides on there and that's it for it. So I've just got the pinion gear propped up on a piece of wood inside of the diff housing here. This way I can use it to support the pinion while I tap on the smaller pinion bearing here because it is basically a press fit itself as well. And then that way it'll stop me having to fight with all of that while trying to line the splines up with the diff flange and it just being annoying. So if I do it this way, that'll be in there nice and tightly and then I can just put the diff flange straight on. I've got this little cup here which is out of my ball joint pressing kit 
that's a nice fit straight over the top of that bearing there. So I'll use that to drive it. If I give this a few light taps, hopefully it will just go on easily for me. There we go, that's now heating I can feel on the crush washer in there. So now I can store the pinion seal. With the bearing pushed up against that collapsible spacer, there's still a little bit of movement in there. That's what comes out when you crush the collapsible spacer and establishes the bearing preload. Next, before I put the diff flange on, I need to put in the pinion seal. This is meant to sit either flush or 0.25 millimeters below the lip of the or the face of the case here. Before I put all of this in, I just cleaned up the surface in here with a little bit of 2000 grit sandpaper. So before I install it, I'm just going to give the pinion seal a light coat in RTV. Normally I would install these with grease only on the outside, but someone in the past who's removed the pinion seal has put little scratches in the outside of the steel here. So just to be sure to make sure it doesn't leak, I'm going to do it this way. So there's the seal installed. It's just slightly under flush with the housing. Next I can install the diff flange. I've put a little bit of grease here on the splines as per the factory manual just to help install it. And I've also heated this diff flange up really hot so it hopefully will slide on a bit easier for me. I've given the surface where the seal runs a bit of a clean again with some 2000 grit sandpaper. And then I've just put a little bit of bearing grease on there as well to help lubricate the seal. You'll see here a little tiny mark that I've made. That's where I had the diff flange aligned when I pulled it off. So I've got a similar mark on there as well and it should go back on in the same spot. I really don't think it matters if you don't. But like I said earlier, I'm just going to do it just in case. So this thing is so hot now I actually can't touch it, which is making it a bit of fun to install. Right, so that's got that on now enough that I can get the pinion nut on there with ease. So next up I'm just going to make up a little tool here so I can measure the bearing preload and then I'll start tightening it down. So here's the method I've come up with to measure the bearing preload. You can get a special tool for this such as a dial torque wrench or some deflecting beam torque wrenches with a nice gauge on them can be used as well. However, the way I'm going to do it is I've got a simple luggage scale here and I've got a bar that's got a hole drilled exactly 250 millimeters from the center of the pinion. Now with torque, one Newton meter is basically equal to one Newton of force on a meter long length. So a 250 mil length is going to be four times that. Now a Newton meter translates to roughly around about 100 grams. So one Newton meter of force on here would be 400 grams of weight applied at this hole here. So all I need to do is hook in my scale that I've got here. And drag it around and it will measure our weight. This little luggage scale can be picked up from super cheap for all of ten dollars and it's accurate down to five grand so it's completely fine for what I want to do and it is definitely way cheaper than spending say four hundred dollars on a dial torque wrench. Now before I install the pinion nut I'm just going to give it a bit of a coating with some Loctite and I may put a little bit of RTV around the face of the nut here just to prevent any oil being able to leak past the splines. Now you probably don't really need to do that step because 
this thing is really designed to bite down into the face of that diff flange there and create a seal much like your sump plug would so i've got here a page out of the ford manual which is readily available online which lists all of our specifications for the diff now i've got here the measurements for our preload on the pinion this is measured with the seal on and it's available for both new bearings and used bearings in this case we're using a new seal and new bearings so we need to go with that option so the manual calls for 1.4 to 2.4 newton meters of preload i've done the calculations there and it's 142 to 244 grams on a meter but because i'm using a 250 mil long bar that measurement is now four times as large as i mentioned earlier so that translates to 568 to 976 grams of force required to set the correct pinion preload so i've got the metal bar i made up earlier just to hold the diff flange still first i just want to do the nut up and slowly pull on the actual flange onto the diff properly and then i can start collapsing that crushable spacer i just want to basically check the pinion flange occasionally and check that there's still play in it and the moment that i stop feeling any play in it that's when i want to start being really slow about what i'm doing and start checking the measurement of the bearing preload with that scale now it is going to take quite a lot of force to collapse that spacer so you're probably going to want a sizable kind of breaker bar to do it with and preferably a decent socket People said it took a lot, I didn't think it took that much. That's nuts. So, quick tool review Toledo breaker bar, it sucks. I was giving it my absolutely everything there trying to get that thing to tighten up and I just could not do it at all. I was jumping on it, I was levering on it with everything, nothing was happening and I was starting to think has the Loctite gone off too quick or is there something wrong and then as a last ditch attempt I grabbed my little cheap Stanley and put my handle off my trolley jack on it and it did it up fine. This thing here was just bending and flexing and couldn't do it so $120 breaker bar no good anyway I've got that now up to the right tension when I say that you got to be careful nipping that thing up I really do mean it I got the play out of this thing and then I gave it like an eighth of a turn and I thought I'll give it a little bit more but I didn't I checked it and it was already right up on the higher end of spec so I've currently got around 800 grams on it Let's see if we can get that on camera so it's about 800 it was showing 900 for a second there just when I was pulling on the wrong angle now, if we remember our spec there calls for 568 to 976 so if we're in the mid 800s we're fine there but yeah just be really careful because if i get have given it that little bit extra it would be well and truly over and then i'd have to get a new collapsible spacer pull the whole thing apart and start again so i've got the diff mounted back on this little stand again and the same deal as with the pinion bearings i've given the carrier bearings a little lube up with some gear oil I've also replaced the o-rings on these little side adjusters here i didn't bother filming that because i figured it's pretty self-explanatory 
flick the old ones off, put new ones on, done. Another thing I'll note is you'll remember when I pulled this apart, I was able to freely spin this gear and it made a heap of rally noises. Now it's got a bit of restriction on it from the preload. It doesn't freely spin anymore and there's no bad noises coming out of it. So I've installed the div center and just loosely done the screw adjusters up by hand. I've wound them in until the backlash feels sort of roughly within spec and now I've set up the dial indicator. So this will have to be done in two steps. The first step, I plan to set up the backlash and get that as close as I can. Next up, I'll have to set up the bearing preload. When I adjust the preload, that's likely to potentially move the backlash slightly. So it's going to be sort of a balancing act going back and forwards between the two and get it until I get it just right. Currently we're measuring somewhere around 16, 15, 16 thousandths of an inch of backlash. And it should be between 5.1 and 7. So what this means is that the screw adjuster on this side needs to be pushed in and this side needs to be wound out. So I'll take the screw adjuster tool I made earlier and first off I'll back out the screw adjuster on this side. And then I'll turn in the screw adjuster on this side approximately the same amount. Now that's done, I zero out the dial indicator again. And that's brought us down to 13th hour of backlash. So we've still got a fair way to go. Seeing how much that took, I'll give it a fair bit more this time. Again, we zero out the dial indicator. We're getting close, we're at eighth hour now. What I'm gonna keep doing is I'm just gonna play around with this for a while until I get it right, and then I'll come back with the camera. So I've fiddled around for a bit, and I've finally got the backlash within spec. So this gear set has a bit of variation between one side to the other. It's around about a thou of an inch. In the specs, it says that you can have up to 1.96. So this here is the tighter side of the gear, which is running right in on six thou. And then the looser side of the gear sits in at seven thou. Now I've got that sorted, I can take it back off the stand and put it on the bench and have a look and see how we're going for bearing preload. So now with the backlash set up in the range it's meant to be, I can get on with checking the carrier bearing preload. I've used the same method again with a little flat bar there and the pull scale on it. What Ford says in the manual is a bit of a weird system with wrapping a rope around the crown wheel and using this special tool that they have. I don't know how it's calibrated or what it measures in, nothing in there says about it. So what I've done instead is this here. So the original pinion bearing preload was measuring at 850 grams. Now with the carrier bearing preload, it's measuring at 1,045 grams. So you take away the original 850, which is your pinion, which leaves you 195 grams but a diff is a torque multiplier. So we have that 195 grams that we're measuring multiplied by the ratio of the diff, which is 3.46. When you do that, you get 467 grams. When we look over here at what our carrier bearing calls for, we've got 448 to 1,140. 
so we're on a looser side of spec but in spec for that one so i spent a bit more time off camera just dialing in the backlash and the bearing preload on the diff center it is quite a tedious task because every time you make a small adjustment to the backlash no matter how much you think you've perfectly matched each side's adjustment you end up putting the preload out and it's either too high or too low then you go back and fix that and then the backlash has gone out and to make it even harder depending on what part of the ring gear you're on the backlash does have some variation in it so you need to take that into account as well however if you spend your time for a bit and just go backwards and forwards between it all you can get it dialed in eventually taken a few measurements of what i've ended up coming up with i've also done the maths and reversed my calculations for my little measurement system there for measuring my preload so it's now back in newton meters just to make it a bit easier to understand so when using new bearings our diff center calls for 1.1 to 2.8 newton meters and i've ended up with 1.8 for the pinion with new bearings and the new seal it calls calls for 1.4 to 2.4 and I've ended up with 2.1 then for your backlash we're looking at 5.1 to 7.08 thousandths of an inch and I've ended up with 5.75 to 7 which is taken into account the variation across the ring gear then we list here our specification for our maximum vari variation across the ring gear and it calls for 1.96 thousandths of an inch and I have 1.25 on this one and then finally we have our ring gear run out which has at a maximum of 5.1 thousandths of an inch and this one has two thou I also have here the measurement that I had for the limited slip clutch pack slip this was measured way before I started filming this video now you are meant to check this in the car with the oil hot after drive obviously I didn't do that because it was sitting in the dip in the suspension cradle in my yard however when i checked it cold i ended up with 110 newton meters which is within spec so it should be somewhere within the region of where it needs to be now i've got that all measured up the final step is to put some more gear marking paint back on those teeth and run a mesh pattern check and see where it's sitting so i've got my gear marking paint on and i've ran a quick mesh check Things are looking better than they were before I disassembled it, but not perfect. So the coast side of the gears is looking pretty well spot on. Got a nice mark here that's pretty well concentrated in the centre of the gear. The camera shows the paint being a bit mushed around the place, but it starts nice in the centre there and then wears out each side of it. However, the drive side of the gear is not perfect. On a nice new set of gears that's set up properly, we'd want to see the mark pretty well centralised, just like on the coast side. However, on this, it's closer down towards the toe of the gear. We're centred pretty well around here, and then it fetters out a bit. Again, the camera makes the paint look a bit messy because this isn't proper gear marking paint. However, where I'm pointing with the pen here is about where the concentration of the mark is. If your mark is down closer towards the toe on the drive side of the gear, that generally indicates that you have your pinion too close to the ring gear and you need to put in a thinner pinion shim. Now, some diagrams I've shown, seen on the internet say that it's pretty normal on a used set of gears for the contact pattern on the drive side to be down a little lower and that it's normal when it's like that for it to be smack bang in the middle for your co side of the gears. Now, I could muck around pulling all the bearings back out, taking out the pinion shim and trying to get that mark close to the centre. However, because this is a used set of gears and I don't know how long they've been ran like this, I suspect there's just as much risk of introducing gear set noise trying to get that mark spot on this in the centre as there is just leaving it how it is. So I thought I might go a little bit more in depth regarding the contact markings that I've got on that gear set. I've got here a contact pattern chart which shows your typical desirable mesh patterns. You'll see here that you've got your markings for a desirable pattern on the centre of the teeth for both your coast and drive sides. If you come down here, it will say that when your pinion shim is too thick, you'll end up with a mark that's down lower on the drive side of the gear and up higher on the coast side of the gear. 
almost every single chart that you look at will show this same sort of situation and it appears that it seems to be covering new gears only. In my case, I had a bit of a different situation where my contact mark for my drive side was down lower on the tooth, which would indicate that you need a thinner pinion shim. However, my coast side was pretty well smack bang in the center here where it should be, which had me a little bit confused. After digging around a little more, I found some other charts that show your mesh patterns for both new and used gears. This showed a different situation entirely. On your new gears, your mark is quite close to the center again. However, on this chart, it is down a little bit lower than some of the others I've seen. But if we come over to our used gears, it shows that your contact mark for your coast side has now crept right up to the center, like mine, and your contact mark on the drive side is down towards the toe of the gear, which is again like mine, though mine is up a little higher here. Given that I have absolutely no idea what the mileage is on this gear set or how much wear might be on them, I'm pretty confident looking at this here that where they're currently sitting is correct. However, it won't be until I actually put the diff in the car and drive it that I'll know that it's correct. And unfortunately, this is just part of using a set of used gears that you've never heard run before. I have no idea how they will turn out. Now I've got the gear marking paint all cleaned off. All that's really left is for me just to seal up the diff and put the rear cover back on. But before I do that, I'm just going to tip a little bit of gear oil in there just so I can get it over everything to make sure it's all well lubricated and nothing rust before I put the diff in the car. This isn't the right stuff that I've got here and I will drain it out before I actually give the diff a proper fill with the right oil. But for now, this should do just fine. For sealant, I'm just using Permatex Ultra Black Gasket Maker. So you can use anything else that's oil resistant and designed for the job. I prefer to just run a small bead around the outside of the diff and go around all the bolt holes as well. And then put the diff cover on, do the bolts up finger tight and then let it set up for an hour and then torque them down properly as per the instructions from Permatex. Some people like to smear the RTV over the place and put the cover on. I've done it that way before and it works as well but however you do it make sure the surface is nice and clean and you use a decent quality rtv because if this thing leaks the only way to fix it is remove the entire suspension cradle from the car just to get access to the diff which is not a job anyone wants so there's the diff all completed and ready to be installed into the xr6 Got the diff hat all sealed back up and reinstalled. Got these little locking plates reinstalled. Their job is just to lock into these side adjusters here to make sure that they can't move from their position. As I said earlier in the video, this is the first time I've ever pulled a diff apart or done any work to one, let alone rebuilding them. So the whole experience has been a massive learning curve for me. However, overall, I didn't find it too difficult and they're really quite simple. While I was only fitting new bearings to this diff, the process would be quite similar if you were installing a new diff sensor such as a true track or changing your diff gears. Just if you were doing that, there would be some extra involvement regarding setting up your pinion depth, etc. However, the main purpose of this video was just to show how one of these is actually disassembled because I know that when I was going to this, I couldn't find anything on the internet about how to do it and I would have appreciated it at the time. My only concern really from now is just hoping that the diff's going to run quiet. Obviously these are an unknown new set of gears and I have no idea how many miles are on them or what sort of life they've lived before I got them. If there's anyone out there watching these videos who has more experience with rebuilding diffs than myself, please do put in any comments, anything else that you would recommend because as I said again, I am learning with this so it'll help anyone else that's watching as well. The plan in the next couple of weeks will be to install the diff in the car. My Christmas holiday is coming up and then I'll finally get to see if it runs nice and quietly. So if you are interested in seeing that, keep an eye out for that video because it'll be coming up next. Other than that, if you did enjoy the video and you'd like to see more content like this posted on the channel in the future, please do feel free to like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.